Hello and welcome from Westminster Libraries. My name is Monica. I work at Paddington Library. We are delighted to welcome Kate McDonald today for the third talk with Westminster Libraries on telling LGBTQ plus stories. Some of you already know Kate, a literary historian and the director of Handel Press. And this afternoon, we are pleased to welcome our guest, Francis Bingham, author of Valentine Ackland, A Transgressive Life. Kate will be talking with Francis about the practicalities of publishing LGBTQ plus stories in fiction, poetry and nonfiction. Before we get going, just to let you know that the talk will be approximately 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A where we will be taking your questions. The moderators, Susie and Sarah, are here with me this afternoon and we look forward to seeing your questions. Well, that's all from me. I shall hand over to Kate and Francis. Thank you, Monica. Good to see you. So let's start from the beginning. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Kate McDonald and I run Handheld Press, which is a small independent publisher. And one of the things we do is we focus on voices that are not often heard. And when I heard a play on BBC Radio 4 um, about a year and a half ago now, it was about the writers Sylvia Townsend Warner and Valentine Ackland, both of whom I'm very interested in because we have published books about them. This is a study of the two of them, um, published by Peter Haring Judd, which is one of our first books. So I listened to the play and I thought, why haven't we got a biography of Valentine Ackland? And I spoke to the biographer of Sylvia Townsend Warner, and she said, well, you should talk to Francis because this play. And I thought, yeah, you, good Lord, yes, of course I should. So I got in touch with Francis and said, do you have a biography of Valentine Ackland that you'd be willing to write? And she said, well, I just happen to have one with me. Francis, could you explain how you happen to have a biography of Valentine already semi-written when I got in touch with you? Because I think this illustrates um, one of the aspects of publishing LGBT LGBTQ plus stories. It's not just about we've got to get the stories out. It's about the publishing business, too. Yes, that's very true. Um, I was originally commissioned to write a biography of Valentine almost 20 years ago um, by the Women's Press, um, which was then um, publishing. It was, it was sort of kind of quite like Virago at the time, really, mm. the similar kind of things. Um, and um, so they were interested in this book and um, I was very keen to do it. Um, I'd already written a bit about Valentine. Um, I was doing a series um, for Diva magazine um, of articles about um, lesbian uh, writers and artists and so on. So it was kind of a gay culture thing. Um, so I'd already been to the archive um, in Dorchester to research that and got very interested in the whole idea. Um, and um, when I sent them a proposal, they were very interested and they commissioned me to write the book. Uh, but unfortunately, by the time I'd written it, um, they were, they'd been in some financial difficulty and they then actually folded. Mm -hmm. So the book didn't come out. Um, and in some ways, I think I was quite lucky, um, paradoxically, because... Um, beginning to research it then, I was able to speak to lots of people who'd um, known Silver and Valentine, not just when they were old, but, you know, before. Um, I was able to interview loads of people um, who are no longer with us. Um, but uh, writing it or revising it, rewriting it again for you, um, there were lots of, there was lots of new stuff that had come out. Um, mm -hmm. The MI5, papers had been released so we knew that they'd been under surveillance by MI5 from the 1930s officially till the end of their lives but certainly actively well into the 50s and 60s um, and also when I was writing the biography originally um, Peter Judd uh, wasn't allowing anybody to read uh, the letters um, from 
Valentine's uh, or that Valentine had written to her American lover, um, Elizabeth Wade White, uh, because he was planning to do the book himself. So he wouldn't let anybody else read them. <laughs> well, I read a few of them that Valentine had kept copies of um, in her diary. So I did have some of them that, that were included in the book, um, but not the whole lot. Um, and they do give a very different angle on, mm -hmm. um, particularly on the Sylvia Townsend Warner's relationship um, with Elizabeth Wade White. So those were all, that was all new stuff that I was able to include in the new book. Uh, so it's a good combination. I kind of got both, got it both ways. You do, so you do. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the publishing landscape in, what, 20 years ago, the Women's Press and Virago and Pandora Press, they, these were the leading publishers most likely to want to publish lesbian lives, that stories by lesbians about lesbians and looking at gay culture more generally, but because there are three feminist publishers, obviously they're more interested in lesbian lives. I don't think there was much about trans lives at that time. There certainly was very little in print. So really to get the stories out, we, we are dependent on the publishing industry to take the financial risk and take the commercial risk. When the Women's Press wanted you to do the book originally, were they super enthusiastic? Did you, do you, did you ever get a sense that they, they thought they might be taking a risk or did they think, yes, this will sell? Well, as a writer, it's very hard to tell because mm -hmm. I think publishers usually keep their cards pretty close to their chest about that. Mm -hmm. um, but they gave me a, um, a good contract um, with a sizable um, payment for it. Um, I perhaps should have rung slight alarm bells with me when the check that I got, um, there it was, four figures only, rather than six or eight. Um, <laughs> it was a personal check from Naima Tala. Um, um, tell us who Naima Tala was, for those of us who are less younger overall, than 40. He was the overall owner of the Women's Press um, mm. at the juncture. Um, which, and you know, he, a very wealthy man. Um, so he didn't go bust, the women's press went bust. Mm. Um, but I think perhaps I should have thought at that point, um, perhaps all is not totally well here. Yeah. Uh, but the check didn't bounce anyway, so that was probably lucky. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, you know, I think, I don't think that, 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 I don't think that they had any feeling that it was a huge risk. I think they thought they were, um, they, they had various fallings out and difficulties of various sorts about which mm -hmm. direction it should go in. Um, and I think that you are right um, in that there's always a bit of friction about which voices should be heard, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. which, um, which need to be the dominant voices. Um, and sometimes, the people who actually own the publishers or have the money be behind it uh, want to go in a different direction from the editors and managers and so on. So there can be, you know, in the sort of slightly bigger publishers, I think there can be lots of internal politics and, and conflict yes. that <clears throat> yes, of course. don't really know about it usually. No, no. Kind of hearsay. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm quite interested in you saying about them <clears throat> taking a financial risk um, because I think that was certainly true then, but I would say now that a lot of mainstream publishers, it's far more that they want to uh, get in on the pink pound, mm -hmm. that no niche is too niche for them to want to have it for themselves. Yes, indeed. Yeah, the pink pound has been around as a phrase for a very long time. Um, but I still think it's relatively recently that mainstream publishing felt felt able to publish books about lesbian and gay lives and promote lesbian and gay fiction as a niche in itself. Um, I think they're still stuck at that, 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 um, that stage. So now it's, um, if, if a writer is lesbian or gay, they're far more likely to be promoted as a lesbian and gay writer rather than a historical novelist or a, a biographer of great political figures. We're, we're moving towards that happier state, I think, but still I think we're stuck in this culture where the sexuality of the author or the subject is of paramount importance. And in some contexts that's, that's appropriate, but in other contexts it's just about as relevant as the colour of their hair or their eyes. It's a strange thing. 
Um, as well as publishers, the bookshops are terribly important. Um, and we're more or less the same age, and I think we probably were in London from the 80s onwards. So we can remember the great bookshops like Silver Moon and Gaze the Word, which is still going strong. Outside London, I'm not so clear what bookshops there were for looking for books about gay and lesbian lives. There are many more now, but 20, 30 years ago, I don't know. What, what, what have you got to say about that? What do you remember? I, I was thinking about um, Libertas in, in York, um, mm -hmm. uh, going in the, I think, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and that's quite interesting. Um, it, it, was, it was a lesbian and gay bookshop. Um, there was great excitement when it opened in York and a certain amount of shock um, of course, I mean, York, is a, York is, a, is a sophisticated city, you know, it's got university and everything. Um, but there was, you know, even then there was a little bit of, ooh, you know, would you be Free seen? <laughs> um, and I think, it's quite, I think it's quite an interesting point because, I mean, I, I know York well because my grandparents lived there at that stage. So we used to visit them quite often. So we used to go into Libertas. But it was outside Libertas in the same street that I was pushed off the pavement. I mean, and, you know, with into the path of cars um, in, you know, which is kind of just like normal <laughs> all the time. Oh, gosh. You know, it's, and, and I think that's a kind of good example of, of the paradox that a place can be um, sophisticated or advanced enough to have a bookshop like that. But at the same time, when you're actually out in the street, it doesn't mean that it's you're particularly safe to be going into it. Mm -hmm. um, and Libertas ha had a big festival. I don't know if you know about this, but I've read it several times. Um, it was huge. I mean, mm -hmm. people do it from all over the country. They took over the York race course, the great big centre there. And, yeah. you know, they had everybody there. Bar McDermott, Sarah Waters, all the great and good. Um, and it was huge, absolutely massive. Um, and then after a few years, that was taken over by Diva. Mm -hmm. the magazine. And of course, Diva Books is another publisher that one should remember about um, at that point. Um, they published lots of novels. They published lots of um, anthologies, um, several of which I had short stories in. Um, and um, they they were, I think, very important. Um, but again, that's interesting because, of course, they were to an extent bankrolled by um, Milliver's Prowler, um, who are uh, a much bigger organisation. So they also have lots of other kinds of gay shops and mm -hmm. lots of... Um, I think a lot of lesbian things then were partly bankrolled by um, things that were sold to gay men. Huh, interesting, I mean, okay. Um, books and other things too. Mm. Um, and then as time went on, I mean, you mentioned Diva. When did Diva begin as a mainstream magazine? The magazine you could find in Smiths or elsewhere? That was in the 90s as well. Yeah. I, th I don't, yeah, I think it was early 90s. Is that when the phrase lipstick lesbian became prominent? I've got a dim memory. I was living abroad from 2001, so I know I've missed a lot of the 2000s of UK culture, but I do remember lipstick lesbian being a thing in the media. And it may have been late 90s. I should think sure. it was 90s, yeah. Yeah. So there was a fashion element uh, and, um, and also late onset lesbianism. That also became a thing with Mary Portis, who did the Shopping Empire shows. So suddenly it seemed that being lesbian was no longer scruffy and grungy and being shoved off the pavement into the path of cars. It, it was a fashionable thing. I was, to be grungy, though. I was always very smart. Oh, very well, I, I didn't mean you personally, naturally, but, you know, <laughs> there's a rebellious element in there which might adopt some scruffy grunge, you never know. Um, so the fashion, once lesbianism became more fashionable, I think then it's likely that um, publishing, for example, and there are many, many industries which, which would have paid attention to that element of the pink pound, but publishing, which is what we're focusing on, it realised that, okay, lesbianism is now a fashionable thing, therefore we can publish books which have lesbianism and, and no one, and, and they're going to be trade, they're not going to be niche and, and small print runs only. 
there has been a pretty important evolution. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting to think about books that were published before then, mm -hmm. which were, might not have been marketed as specifically lesbian, but, but had lots of lesbian content and people knew to buy them. Yeah. Um, for example, the, um, you know, the Microcosm by Maureen Duffy, mm -hmm. published in 1966. And that's, that's a seminal lesbian mm -hmm. tech. Um, and of course, I mean, you know, The Well of Loneliness was published in 1928. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a slightly different issue because all hell broke loose when it was published. But, but you know, there have been a lot of books since then and happening at the same time that, mm. that I think obviously wouldn't be marketed as lesbian because there wouldn't be a place in the bookshop to put them. No. But I think that, that people have always been able to find those things if they've known where to look and there's always been a strong word of mouth thing about this is happening yeah in, um you know Vita Sat of the West um her poetry collection King's Daughter you know her husband Harold said to her it's too lesbian the content is too blatantly lesbian don't publish it mm. in the 30s at some point I think um late 20s or early 30s so I think that that partly it's about um as you say, fashion, yeah, and, and and what is sayable in public, and what is, and also, in yeah, and there's also where are you going to shelve it in Waterstones or the predecessors of Waterstones, Ottercars and Dillons and so on. Um, I think works that were buying about lesbian lives would have gone automatically to feminism. So under feminism, you would have an um, it would be an umbrella, a safe place for works about lesbian lives to live. I'm not sure where works about gay men's lives might live. I'm thinking particularly of the biography of Gluck, the, the artist, who was a prominent figure in the 1920s. And I remember there was a big, big biography of her came out. I think it was by Diana Sipani. Yeah, it came out in the mid 80s. And I was interested in it because of what research I was doing at the time. And I could only find it in Silver Moon in, in London. I know I went to other big bookshops on Charing Cross Road looking for this because I'd read about it. Could not find it anywhere, not even in foils. But Silver Moon had it because Silver Moon was the feminist bookshop with a very substantial lesbian, you know, shelf load. So that's what I meant when I'm saying that um, it could be difficult to find a book if it was had lesbian content and the bookshops felt they were going to be uncomfortable selling it or couldn't quite know how to, how to put it on the shelves and where to put it. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, I would have thought, I can't remember who published that, although I've got it on the shelf behind me. <laughs> um, but I think, um, I mean, I think that's a kind of partly connects with another whole issue about when, when you can find a book anywhere and how many copies of it are in a shop at any one time. Yes shelf space altogether and so on, which is a whole mm. issue. Um, because I don't think that that was published by any um, sort of, any niche publisher. I think that's- No, it was a mainstream major biography. Yeah, it was a big biography. And, mm. you know, a fascinating and amazing life. Um, and again, you know, that also leads back to the same thing that, I mean, she lived a very openly lesbian mm. life. Mm. Um, and, you know, wore a suit every day of it. Um, and, you know, she didn't, she did, I mean, she was rich. So obviously that was, um, made it a lot easier for her. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lovely story in that book um, when she was traveling with Constance Spry, the flower arranger, yeah. she like painted those beautiful paintings of her, of her flowers. Very good exhibition in the Garden Museum right now in London. It's beautiful nice. exhibition. Yeah. And um, they, they were driving somewhere, they stopped um, at a tea place and um, a clergyman began to abuse Gluck for being as she was mm. and took her off a strip. And Constance Spry, I've always had a very soft spot for her for this, sprang to her defence and said, you should be ashamed of yourself and you a man of the cloth. <laughs> it was a wonderful expression. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, he was totally routed. Yeah. But I think that's interesting too, you know, apropos of what you're talking about, that um, what risks people took and that, even, you know, no amount of privilege could actually 
shelter them from that mm. kind of, you know public opprobrium yeah do you going back to valentine and sylvia do you did you find in your research any instance of those two women being verbally abused in the street or i don't know picked on in some way ostracized socially they withdrew themselves from society by living in a very small village in dorset and quite an unreachable village but their the local people accepted them they were just the women who lived together or is that a my misunderstanding no i think that's true i think they were accepted by the local people um i think that they were accepted to the extent that they were foreigners anyway. Mm. So what they did was going to be crazy. And um, that they were, um, they weren't, you know, it's very different if you go and visit somewhere and you're not a part of it. Mm -hmm. If you were born there and you, and you don't conform. And I think that so to a certain extent, that was a thing that was different for them. But I mean, they, I think they were quite careful in some ways. I, I, they, had, they definitely did experience um, lots of prejudice um, in lots of ways, you know, some subtle, some not so subtle. Um, there was, you know, one bit that I read in Valentine's diary, which is in the twenties, um, but I was struck by that she's, she was driving Sylvia to Victoria station in London and she's got her truck, Valentine's wearing trousers so when they get to the station it's very busy and she decides not to get out because it might make it awkward yes so um, yeah self-protective mechanisms oh so, yeah there's a kind of yeah. going on there and mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know that's a sort of very minor example but you think well what would have happened if she got out mm. um, yeah and and you know you remember, of course, um, in the the book that um, Robert Frost expressed his disgust at their relationship quite openly in a letter to a friend, and they mm -hmm. then a letter was then published, you know, and that was fine. It was perfectly acceptable for him to say how appalled he was, um, and that I think that there was a lot of that. Uh, they talk about. Um, um, Gerald Brennan in the village saying to them, making a sort of snide remark about, oh, young men aren't very lucky here. And Sylvia says that was supposed to be a, you know, a dig at us for being lesbians. Then she's yeah. brave, brave for him. Um, and, but you know, it's, I think they, I think that they, they definitely faced on a, on a, an everyday level. Um, People's people's disapproval. Yeah, um, um, microaggressions possibly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and those are the details. It's that kind of texture of life that makes lesbian and gay biography so important, because those that felt experience is completely lost, and it will never appear. It's probably so minor and so everyday as to be hardly even mentioned in letters. So that's why one of the reasons I am very keen on promoting biography of the voices that are not heard so much, in this case, lesbians and gays. Um, because these, the, the details of these lives, it's so crucial to record these so that other people might feel, actually, I too get that now. Things have not changed. I feel, yeah. and, and they feel what they feel, and really many things you could feel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the, the wider circle of Valentine and Sylvia, there, there are a number of individuals and couples in your biography of Valentine, who I'd like to explore a little bit, think about their lives and how their lives have been represented, what, what's around. And I want to start um, Benjamin Britton and Peter Pears, or Peter Pears, I'm never quite sure if it Pears or Pears, anyway. Um, I heard a really good episode recently on the Bad Gays podcast by Ben Miller and Hugh Lemney about Benjamin Britten, which I found fascinating because I know him as a composer. I have not ever thought of him as a gay man, though obviously I knew he was gay. But to hear an episode, you know, an hour or so of detail about this man's life as a gay man was just revelatory. So podcasts can do a great deal. Have you come across studies of that man, those men together as artists? which is also written from the perspective of them as gay men, or is it really just their artistic work that dominates? 
I don't know a huge amount about Benjamin Britten. I've read the um, Humphrey Carpenter biography, mm-hmm. um, and I so, and you know I'm aware of the um, Crasks, which are mm-hmm. which the paint the drawings, paintings, and so on. Uh, the embroidery, yes. But um, which Valentine and Sylvia collected, and a lot of which have now ended up um, in the Red House at Oldborough. Mm-hmm. Um, what I do know that I think is relevant to what you're talking about is that um, after Valentine's death um, and Benjamin Britten's death, so that Peter Pears treated Sylvia as a kind of fellow bereaved mm. widow, widower, um, and was very, very sympathetic to her um, and that felt that their relationship was was parallel i mean sorry their experience was parallel because their relationships although public in many ways and it, you know even publicly an artistic partnership weren't sort of socially recognized mm-hmm. um, and so that to some people their loss was kind of invisible um, mm. and i think that that that's a, a an interesting point at which um you know gay men's experience um although of course it wasn't identical because um of the illegality of their relationships at the same time it had a lot of parallels um especially in that um you know what's happened it's just a friend who you know you've lost rather than the sort of life partner yes um which is extraordinary to think of anybody sort of saying to you know you can't imagine that in in any sort of heterosexual uh, scenario no, not at all no but and there would be amount there might be malice and spite as well mm. pleasure and reject rejecting the life partner because of the illicitness of the relationship yeah 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 and then there are the very the spectacularly famous women nancy cunard and anna may wong with both of whom uh, Valentine had tempestuous affairs, probably very loving affairs, but still a certain amount of tempestuosity. Um, you know, I had no idea that Anna Mae Wong was gay or bisexual at all until I read your biography. I knew about Nancy Cunard, but Nancy Cunard's life has been documented quite a lot in terms of her, uh, her association with people who were not white because she, she set up the magazine Negro, she had black lovers, and she was terribly interested in, and supportive of black arts. But Anna Mae Wong was a revelation again to me. I had no idea. What, what has been written about her as a lesbian woman? Or as a lesbian I, don't, was a I don't know that anything has, actually. Um, I think that there's been quite a revival of interest um, in Anna Mae Wong um, as an actor. Mm. Um, you know, several of her films have been re-released by the BFI. Um, Piccadilly. Uh, we went to the premiere of the of the newly um, remastered version of Piccadilly, and with you know with the live music. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> and that was a fabulous occasion. It was huge. The millions of people there, and it, it is a it is a you know wonderful silent movie. And I must say, she is incredibly beautiful. And the kind of awful orientalism of the period is is. <laughs> is kind of undercut in a way by her presence you know Mm -hmm. yeah Um, and uh it was very enjoyable and um several of her other films now you can watch on the um on the bfi player Mm -hmm. Um, some of which are not very good uh it has to be said um her speaking voice wasn't as good as her as her silent film presence Mm -hmm. um of course she had an american accent and so on so that it doesn't work that well when she's you know, supposed to be a German or whatever it is. But anyway, be that as it may, they're, yeah. they're very enjoyable and interesting. Um, but I think your point about, about her being lesbian, um, I think Valentine really did believe in the slogan, we recruit, you know, she was not bothered at all about, what, about a person's um, previous sexuality or indeed whether they were going to, you know, change their sexuality. I mean, one of the things about writing this book has been, lots of people have, uh, you know, sort of told me things and said, but please don't say anything because it's all very upsetting. And, you know, the, you know, her husband was absolutely distraught when he found out and so on and so on and so on. 
Oh and, wow! Right. Yeah, there's a there's a lot. I think Valentine had um, very much thought, you know, Britain is sort of full of fuckable women, and let's get out there and do it. You know, <laughs> she really didn't oh. want to. Um, you know, I'm blown what they might think about it. <laughs> well, you know, no, I think that she was not. She didn't expect anybody to decline, and very few people did. Wow. Um, I think partly because it because of that sort of no strings attached attitude, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean anything. It's just for this afternoon. So don't worry. And it's women talking or women holding hands and obviously no pregnancy is going to ensue. So why should a husband be upset? Yeah. Um, evade the patriarchal condemnation because it doesn't actually count. I, I think she really I think that's really true. And I think she I think it was it, it did amuse her. I mean, I think she'd had terrible experiences mm. um, from, you know, sort of patriarchal society and uh, particularly um, her own very brief and really, uh, you know, very traumatic experience of marriage. Mm. Um, I think, you know, you could argue, I'm not saying this was so, but I think you could read it that she was on a sort of one person mission to punish those men. <laughs> It does throw up the idea that codifying people, individuals, by their sexuality becomes pretty meaningless when you're dealing with a phenomenon like Valentine, who would have sex with any woman she felt like. Because then that woman, does that woman define herself as bisexual or a temporary lesbian for the afternoon or, you know, lesbian on Wednesdays only? It just yeah. becomes a meaningless category, which then can be extended to the population at large why do we define people in such a way um and that's where circling back to the theme which what we're supposed to be talking about is the the practicalities of publishing lives which are not hetero which are not cis straight it's important to share the experiences and to widen widen the range of material out there so that, that people can learn from and think actually i'm not alone or actually, I am a bit peculiar in what I think, because nobody else thinks like that. It, that's what seems to me to be important. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I think that the other thing that's very important is I think that people need to feel that they have sort of forebears, that, mm. that they're part of a continuum. Um, not that everybody's the same who are a particular way, um, or anything like that, but just that a shared history is a way of finding a people um, and a kind of homeland. Mm -hmm. um, that's a bit of a cliche, but I think it's true. Um, and I think that there's, there's, there's nothing more encouraging than that feeling that it's a community that runs through time. Yeah. Um, and that one has got history um, that's not the same as everybody else's and that if you're excluded from some things, I mean, this is true for, this is, you know, very much true for all women that, you know, for so long history was basically the history of men. Mm. Very few occasional women, um, appeared, mm. but mm. basically it was, it was the story of the world men had made. Um, and that it was to that discovery of feminist history was a wonderful feeling for many people. Um, yeah. I think in the same way, gay, queer, whatever kinds of um, ancestors are really important for people. Mm. And the more stories we can get out there to be part of the landscape of reading, the, the better, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you got any, can you give me a book, that suggest a book that readers might like to know about, which you think might illustrate this? a lesbian or a gay story that really needs to be better known? Have you got anything in mind you can suggest? That is an interesting question because there are so many things that it's <laughs> really difficult to choose. Very, very hard, very oh, hard. <laughs> I would say that one thing that, I've already mentioned the microcosm. Mm -hmm. I think that um, that, that is a, a work that is very interesting from that point of view because it deals with the gay community, um, at the lesbian community who visit the Gateways, um, which was a very famous bar in London in the 1960s. And it tells a lot of stories um, about these women who gather together in this place. Um, mm. 
and I think that that is a that is a book that's really interesting to read about about past history. Um, the other writer that I enjoy reading very much for her beautiful prose um, and her unexpectedness is Sybil Bedford. Um, yes. Mm. And her um, her memoir uh, Quicksands is uh, which you know she wrote very late in life and she died very soon after she finished it when she was in her late 90s. Um, sort of remembers a gay life that covers most of the 20th century. And I think that it links in very interestingly with what you were saying because she doesn't focus all of it on her gayness. Um, mm. But at the same time, it informs everything that happens to her in fact. Yeah. Um, you know, from her very early uh, realization um, that she was gay through, you know, to her sort of very late life, um, very late loves that she, and writing about that and her many, many friendships with gay men and lesbians. Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting book about, about the lesbian past. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, beautiful prose. Right. I would suggest people have a look at Nicola Griffith's work. She began as a science fiction author, moved into lesbian noir, and then more recently published a novel called Hild, which is a retelling of the life of Hilda of Whitby in the seventh century. But it's, re, it's reprogramming history to allow lesbian experience to be there alongside heterosexual exp experience as a completely normal thing, because the Anglo-Saxons apparently did not distinguish between heterosexuality and lesbian and gay. And it's just a phenomenal, powerful, driving historical novel. And Nicola has done a lot of writing. Um, I will now show you a book that we published by Nicola Griffith. This is a very short novel. See how skinny that is. It'll take you four hours to read. Um, about a woman who wakes up one morning, her wife has left her, she's lost her job and she's got a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. But it's written completely within a lesbian paradigm. The world is lesbian and it doesn't matter. It doesn't even need to be said much. The focus on this novel is about finding your people so you can battle your demons and, and get your way through this dreadful situation. But the categorization of lesbian and gay is utterly irrelevant in this present day novel and it's just superb and that, I think that's what Nicola's project is is let's just do away with the need to explain and, and, and fault people let's just get on with living and the sexuality thing will take care of itself right Monica can we summon you back from silence have we any questions to answer we do we do have a few mm -hmm. thank you so much I'll be starting reading the questions. The first one is from Jane. She asks, you mentioned the pink pound. Do you think the commercial success is a passing fashion? Uh, commercial, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna interpret that as commercial success of customers who happen to be gay or lesbian and want to use use their sexuality to spend their money or something like that? Or could it be that publishers are actively looking for the market which is pink and they're targeting their books at it? I think the latter is certainly true. Um, I know when I've been trying to publish, when I've been, well, before we stopped publishing modern fiction because we don't do it anymore, I would be sent novels and I could go, I could absolutely sell this book if I knew where in the lesbian market to pitch it, but I don't have those skills. I don't know how to sell it. So I'm very aware that there is a market, which is the pink pound, and I cannot reach it, but many other publishers can do it really successfully. I think that it will continue to exist for as long as sexuality is an important thing in Western culture, because that's just the way of life. What do you think, Francis? I think that it's, I think that it's, um, I think that it is a fashion at the moment and that it could quite easily um, change. I mean, I agree with you, it, it won't go away totally, but I think the way it's marketed could alter. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't really think that, um, I mean, I think that what goes on in the rest of the world, you know, other, other places where people aren't so lucky, you know, Hungary or Turkey, for instance, um, you know, I think the rights and the freedoms that we have now, we shouldn't take for granted. I think they have to be maintained with care. And I think that fashion um, doesn't always do that. It doesn't necessarily mean that because of things fashionable, it, it will it will always be and it's kind of safe. Um, but sorry, that's probably a, that's probably yeah, probably going off onto a slightly different question there. Um, but um, I do think that sometimes it can feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, if you've been writing away for a long time. And uh, I like to bear in mind that, um, you know, Juna Barnes published The Lady's Almanac herself and sold it on the street herself. Um, and that, you know, Virginia Woolf would never have published Orlando if she hadn't been able to self-publish it. Um, I think that, um, you know, mainstream publishing of, um, let's say pink pound fiction would only last for as long as it made them money. Um, yeah. I don't think there's any commitment to, um, you know, doing it for any good reason, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. The commercial imperative is the primary one. If it doesn't make money, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Thank you. Another question is an anonymous attendee who asks, do you have a particular connection to Valentine and that they commissioned you to write his biography? Me? Um, no, I just think I'm, I'm, I like Sylvia Townsend Warner's fantasy writing very much and I published a lot of it. I like some of her mainstream fiction. I love her short stories. I like her critical voice and I love her biography. Valentine I knew very little about. I knew about her by reading biographies of Sylvia and then reading Peter Haring Judd's, Judd's book. So I wanted to know more and I felt it was very, un very unjust that she should not have a biography to herself the way that Sylvia has several biographical studies. So it was in the, the interest of parity, I think. And also this was a life that had not yet been written fully, properly. And that needed to happen and I was in a position to be able to make it happen by publishing it so that was my connection. Yes I don't have any personal connection with Valentine um, other than as a writer um, and a person who can appreciate I think um, certain aspects of her sexuality or sexual persona um, but I, 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 I could have met her as a, when I was a child, but I didn't, <laughs> um, I, so no, 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 no special connection in that sense. Um, mm. but I, when I, you know, first read her poetry, I did feel that I recognized her voice. Um, and she was somebody that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Jane uh, is uh, is just thanking you and uh, um, and also asking, do you think it still needs courage for writers to write gay and lesbian fiction? Courage. I think it depends on their cer personal circumstances. If they have not yet come out and they want to be a public writer of gay and lesbian fiction, that requires courage in a personal sense. Um, and then there's the literary merit. Do you want to write a novel which is heartfelt and passionate and important from the perspective of the sexuality of the author or the characters, but yet fails from a critical perspective? That also requires courage. So there are many different parameters in which courage is necessary. I think that actually to write, um, to write anything at all requires courage. I think that um, people who don't, you know, are all the ways the, I've always thought I could write a novel if I only had time, um, don't realise at all how, if it's, if it's 
true and heartfelt, it's extremely revealing. It's, mm. it, it opens you up to all kinds of, not only um, that you've told a lot of stuff, but also that people think that if you're prepared to write a work of art, um, it's, it's you. So it's not just that you've bared your soul, but I think often people find it very hard to um, differentiate between the fictional person, the fictional characters, and, you know, and the writer themselves. And, you know, there's this old cliche about it that, you know, just because somebody's written a murder story, you don't think they're a murderer. But <laughs> at the same time, it is extraordinary um, how literally true people think um, often, you know, and how amazingly impertinent they can be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I, so I think that to, to write, to really to write anything um, is, is a very courageous act. And I certainly, certainly think that to write as a gay person uh, is, you know, four o'clock in the morning courage. Um, because it's not just a question of if you're, if you're out. Um, but many people are out and they have a very supportive community. And as you, you know, they may live somewhere where it's fine and it's not a problem. But if you write a book, that book will go into places where it's totally different. It will be read by people who are not sympathetic. Um, many people have members of their families who are very inimical about the whole thing, even if some of them are okay. And the more that they expose their gayness on, you know, even in a very small kind of public arena, um, you know, the more unpopular that will be. So yes, I do think it's brave. And there is also the problem that anything you write that's in, well, for gay lesbian writers particularly, because their identity is predicated on their sexuality, anything they write in fiction about sex and the act of is going to be assumed to be their personal experience. Now, some people may not bother about that, and other people may be absolutely mortified to think that other people think that they've done this or have witnessed it. So, as Francis said, you reveal a lot about yourself when you're writing fiction because you really realise what you're most scared of, but you have to overcome it. I think the, um, the, the sex scenes thing is quite funny. Um, so I used to know somebody who, um, a writer, and she made um, her money on the side by writing gay male porn. <laughs> said at least one thing is, you know, nobody's going to think this is me. <laughs> But yeah, it, a lot of money from it. How people don't really, I mean, non, non writers don't really understand um, the imaginative power that mm. is necessary to, to write a work of fiction. Um, and that it, it, it doesn't necessarily, although it may, it doesn't necessarily, um, it's not necessarily autobiographical, but that even if it is autobiographical, it has gone through an alchemical process. If it, unless it's, unless it's simply confessional, which is tedious, it's different. It's not, it's not just somebody's, you know, experience. It's, it's been made into a work of art through their and Yeah, and it's serving the art rather than serving the writer. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And one more question is, do you think from a, an anonymous attendee, do you think the fashionable nature of lesbianism draws away from what it means to be a lesbian? I'm not a lesbian, so I cannot answer that with any sense at all. Francis, I give that one to you. Well, I think it's an interesting question. Um, and I think that it, it could go either way, really. Um, I think that there is a sense always in which um, what you might call kind of street cred, kind of, or street fashions, they go through to the mainstream and they do lose an element of their authenticity when that happens. Um, you know, kind of minute example, 
there in the 90s there was a kind of specs that were very very narrow like this and um when they first appeared only lesbians wore them kd lang had some all lesbians had them and then of course so they were a real signifier and then very quickly they just became you know ordinary fashion and um so that something of their specialness was lost. So I think there is that element that, yes, when things become fashionable, they can, you know, they can lose something. Um, but I think on the other hand, there is also the thing that um, for, for some people who perhaps have been isolated and not within a community or don't, for whatever reason, you know, geographical or personal, or whatever, can't reach a lot of people. But then I think that if a thing is has become fashionable, even in even if it is a bit shallow, at the same time, it makes it easier for people to to find the authentic and to kind of move move towards it. So I guess it can go both ways. Unlike lesbians. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I couldn't resist that, I'm sorry, sorry. Now there is uh, Melissa who's asking, I was firstly thanking you for um, the utterly fascinating as ever, a talk. And uh, then um, just a comment, to, uh, she just adding, uh, just reminded me of how Rye in Sussex was home to writers Henry James, Radcliffe Hall and Benson. Yeah, Fascinating contrast of life and work <laughs> and behaviour. Yeah. Yes. And just one tiny thing about Rye. Um, also, Noel Coward had a house near there. And, and Beverly Nichols. Did you not live there as well? That, yeah, it was quite. And a she's adding, and the curse of fluid behaviours of Dietrich and Natalula Bankhead. Oh, <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> well, I think we could go on for a very long time. Are there any more questions? No, these so far. Oh, there's one more coming in, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll read this last question. Did the fact lesbianism wasn't illegal make it easier for lesbian fiction to be accepted? I don't think so, really. Um, I mean, we spoke, mentioned briefly earlier, um, the well of loneliness. Mm. Um, and I think that um, the fact that it, um, the book was burnt in the furnaces in the cellars of Scotland Yard. Um, I think of the book, the books as a kind of witch being burnt at the stake. Um, the, you know, the trial for obscenity of that, I think, um, although it, it didn't happen with a lot of, a lot of lesbian fiction got by under the radar because uh, it wasn't so obvious. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, that, I think that shows that it was actually quite dangerous. Um, although it wasn't illegal for lesbians, um, they could be fired from their jobs. I mean, many, many people are alive today who were kicked out of the army or whatever um, for being gay. Um, also that it was treated as, um, as a psychological illness. So there are people alive today who were actually in mental institutions, in asylums because of being lesbians. And, um, as you probably many people watching this know, um, in 1921, there was an attempt to make it illegal, um, which passed through the House of Commons um, and was only kicked out by the Lords um, on the basis that if they told all the women of England about this exciting thing to do, they'd all start doing it. So it was better. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I mean, otherwise it, it would have been become illegal in 1921. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so I think that, I mean, obviously it was much, much more dangerous to be a gay man, um, but I don't think it was by any means safe to be a lesbian. And I think that um, that, that you know, had a knock on effect on, on, 
on lesbian fiction being published too? It was obscenity. Publishers could be prosecuted for publishing obscene works and the definition of obscene depended on which judge was trying the case. So publishers would have tended to play safe. Um, I mean, it wasn't just lesbianism and we're about to publish a novel next year, which is astonishingly about illegitimate pregnancy in 1921. Published in 1921, it's a miracle that didn't get prosecuted at the time because of a very clever absence of words here or there. So if they could fly under the radar, if they could write well enough to disguise the actuality of what they meant, but yet leave the meaning clear enough to those who were in the know, then lesbian fiction was written and published, but they had to be really careful. Thank you. I'm just reading the last uh, comments uh, uh, by Melissa again. And she's uh, just commenting on oh, there must be a need for a new book on the Benson family, personal life, three generations of domestic same-sex partnership and mm -hmm. the clergy with a big exclamation mark. Yep. But <laughs> yes, um, there was a terrific biography. I gosh, was it the Bensons or was it? No, there wasn't. There is a biography of the Bensons, which I, I have downstairs, which is good, but we need a new one because the, that, that family were absolutely bizarre in, anyway, let's not go there. It's an entirely different talk. I think we should end it there, but we do need a new Benson biography. And I would be happy to publish one if anybody wants to write it. Thank you. Now, um, Didier is thanking everyone with many thanks and great chat. And do return is asking, and after these, uh, we'll just uh, um, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Francis, uh, for joining us this, this afternoon. It's been the most interesting chat. And uh, just uh, a reminder that shortly we will be sending an email with a link to our feedback form. And it's, we're always very grateful for your feedback. It's, uh, it's nice to pass on your comments to our speakers. Uh, we'll also send another email in the next few days with a link to the recording of this event uh, and a link to the next talk. It's, uh, we, uh, thank you from all of us, from myself, from uh, Susie and Sarah this evening. And uh, again, thank you, Kate. Uh, thank you, Francis. And uh, we'll see you all. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, and we'll see you all very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.